Yeah, welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Lane podcast. Um, I, I'm in London, of course, as I always am, but the Legendino is in Rio. Crucially, he's only got an hour uh, in Rio. It sounds like a Duran Duran song. Yeah, black olives or, or, or green ones? Which which I'd we go with? Go for the if it's on a pizza, I'd go for the black ones. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I think I'd go for the green ones. Depends. Are you eating a pizza as we speak? No, but it's kind of bread which is quite doughy. It's 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 pizza like. It's a pizza. So it's, it's, it's in pizza. that ballpark. It's Mediterranean, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Yes. Yeah. Well, there you go. It's a pizza. Um, great to have our guest with us. Mark Biram has written an absolutely classic yes. uh, book on Colombian. Well, he has, says Tim Vickery, who wrote the intro to it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And he's got a copy, flashed it in front of me. Viva Colombia. What a great cover as well. Mark, good to have you on the podcast. How are you? Thanks very much for having me. Very good. Thanks. Yeah, it's. Um, I said that you got the, you managed to get the legendino to to write the acknowledgements or whatever it is at the beginning. I'm amazed but... that you found enough money to pay me. Amazed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been saving up for years. Yeah. Yeah, of course, exactly. Oh, it's now or never. <laughs> <laughs> well done. You got him on the sheet. Well done, Mark. I wish we could, um, but no. Genuinely, it's a it's a book, and what a way to write about Colombian history as well through. Um, the uh, memories of, is it 15 footballers or 15 football matches altogether? Uh, both. Both 15 footballers and 15 matches. Sure. And you start where in Colombian? Where does the trajectory of uh, Colombian football history begin for you? Well, it's uh, it starts very early, really. But the the first match that's covered in the, in the book is 62, when Colombia first appear at the World Cup. And then it kind of comes up to modern day. And um, yeah, most of the players included in the book are, kind of, are from the 90s onwards, or well, late 80s onwards, because uh, that's when Colombian football kind of really gains traction and kind of becomes uh, one of the big hitters. It kind of it, it comes a lot later than the big three, Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's kind of from there on that Colombia becomes uh, an important player, really, I guess. I guess it's from there on, from the 90s, maybe even from the 80s, that Colombia hmm. becomes everybody's favourite second team. There's something magical about Colombia in a World Cup. Don't know what it is, but you, you, you expect great things from them, don't you? I've never thought about this, but is it a little bit the fact that it's the same colour shirts as Brazil <laughs> and people know less about them? You know, because mm. you used to mm. watch every four years to see Brazil in a World Cup, didn't you? Now, uh -huh. Uh -huh. maybe some of that appeal has been blunted by familiarity. Because in yeah. the old days, you didn't know any of the players before the World Cup. You got to know them during the tournament. Sure. And do you think, sure. yeah. I think off the top of my head now, do you think part of the, the pizzazz around Colombia is that they're the yellow unknowns? Yeah, I think I think that's definitely part of the allure for me. I mean, I, I think we've you perhaps talked about it in the past, but you know, I, I got to know them through Panini stickers. You know, it was kind of my first World Cup was ninety. That was the first time I saw them, and yeah, I remember the the the, the game against Germany particularly. I was really taken by it. It was just amazing. I just never, I'd never really seen football played like that, um, and yeah, it was it was incredible. And, and as you say, kind of. Uh, you look at the actual achievements of the team. I mean, they, 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 they scrape into the last 16. It all goes a bit pear-shaped against Cameroon. They, they, it's not like they get to the to the final or anything, but but they leave a real mark on people. It kind of it's a it's a classic example of how you know it's yeah, not all about you winning. Do, you know, it's, it's the way that you do it. Absolutely, totally. And it, when you say they leave a real mark on people, I, I think it's a visceral mark. You know the. The, I, I became interested in Colombia, the country, through Colombia, the football team. You know, a lot of people will remember the likes of Carlos Valderrama just for his hairstyle and thinking, wow, Colombia must be quite hip, you know, because yeah. he gets no, to carry he gets to carry that off you know um and whereas here if he was the only one here you know you can imagine how what songs people would be singing about him about a pineapple on his head if he if he yeah. scooped it up of course you know yeah and this was way before jason lee wasn't it it was kind of a, was way before jason lee good, absolutely good right. decades before so yeah but he gave you permission to have your hair anywhere you want and mm -hmm. still be the best footballer on the pitch mm -hmm. 
you know, which was <laughs> quite Absolutely. unusual. You know, usually the best footballer on the pitch would keep a lower profile than that. But and, uh -uh. and there is something. I think Tim's got he, he's got something in that yellow shirt. Um, it's so unusual for us, anyway. A yellow shirt and a yeah, and yellow... the Norwich yellow is different, isn't it? It's kind of it's, it's kind of duller same. somehow, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't catch the glint of the gold the way that the Colombian uh -huh. one does. It, and I'm I'm not sure about the green shorts either. You know, I think oh, it's the combination of the top and the bottom go. as well, with regards to exactly no, with regards to Norwich. My That's time wouldn't be having none of that. Fight. None of that. Well, we'll, wearing... we'll, we'll we'll come back to your tailor in a moment or two. But strangely enough, the match. I say strangely, Mark. You probably won't be strange to you. The match that you've chosen to talk about, as always done, Brazilian Chile podcast to focus on uh, today, hasn't probably got anything to do with the Colombia that most people think about uh, mm. when they think mm -hmm. of Colombia World Cup football. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I guess. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, the the first I saw of the of the men's team was 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 certainly ninety that 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 Valderrama team and kind of got to know them through Panini stickers and in a, in in the same way the first first I remember of the women's team was, was was the match I've chosen for this really it was kind of the the arrival of the women's team at the at the World Cup um, I mean they played at the two thousand and eleven one um, but they went home without scoring a goal got one nil nil draw. Um, and it was kind of, yeah, all kind of a, a learning curve, I guess. But yeah, they arrive at the 2015 one and I chose it really because it's kind of a real David and Goliath kind of contest at, 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 uh, at, at first glance. I mean, uh, they're playing against France, who, yeah, was one of the favourites for the tournament. Um, the France team's just kind of a glittering array of stars. They've got most of the Olympic Lyon team that's going, going to go on to win five women's champions leagues after, after, after this World Cup. So it's a team of considerable pedigree. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Colombian team at this stage in 2015, kind of still at a kind of um, in a transitional phase, really, from, from amateurism. You know, it's kind of um, there's no Colombian women's league really running it's kind of it's a it's a one or two month affair and it's kind of you know played on pitches in terrible condition uh none of the big Colombian teams really have a women's team at this this stage the the, the best team at this stage in Colombia is a team called Formas Intimas of, of, of Medellin um and yeah I mean none of the infrastructure's there um so um you've got a team who kind of not played a competitive game for months, uh, don't really receive salaries for playing the game. Um, and they're playing against this France team, who's just like pretty much the best, got some of the best players in Europe. So I remember when I was tuning in to watch the game, I was just thinking, I hope they don't get thrashed 15 nil or something like that, because that would just be humiliating. I didn't want to see them humiliated because I knew I knew that they, you know, a team of some talent, but just lacking the lacking the infrastructure. But I kind of watched it thinking, uh they're really up against it you know so, and uh, i suppose when the odds are like that you kind of you come into it thinking well, well we'll try and park the bus try and survive the first 10 15 minutes um and then kind of go from there so they, they kind of do that they have a couple of scares manage to keep it at nil nil um and shall i carry on or just to well yeah, no, just, just so it um it is an extraordinary story isn't it Women's totally. football in, in totally. Colombia. I mean, Colombia yeah. is, in populational terms, it's the biggest country in South America, with the exception, mm. of, obviously, of, of, of Brazil. Of Brazil. And mm -hmm. I think me and Mark were of the same opinion, that of all those teams that have never won the Men's World Cup, Colombia are amongst the most likely. They're one of the teams that one day has the potential to, to, to win a World Cup. But in, in, in terms of the women's game, that process has happened much quicker. They've come much mm -hmm. further in a, in, in, a, in a much shorter space of time in a society which is, I haven't been there for a while, but in a society which, even by Brazilian standards, when I was there, I thought this is unbelievably socially conservative. So it, it is an, an extraordinary story that Columbia, yeah. the Colombian women, off their own back, have been able to do this 
Why? What? How? How do you think that this has happened? What are What are the factors? Been because in in the men's game in in South America, Argentina and Brazil are kings. In the women's game, Brazil rule the roost. But Colombia are by far their closest challengers. This is true at national team level. And the final of the last Copa America, the uh, last women's Copa America was a narrow Brazil win over Colombia. But it's also true at club level. We just had the final of the, the women's Libertadores. And the final was, was Corinthians of Brazil against Santa Fe of, of Colombia, which you can just shut your eyes and imagine you're, you're watching a North London derby because Corinthians wear, wear white shirts and, and dark shorts. And Santa Fe, their kit is explicitly modelled on Arsenal. Uh, and uh, so in this battle of morality, we had the right result and Corinthians won. It's Colombia who are always pushing Brazil. Uh, how, how has this happened? Good question. It's a good question. I mean, I, yeah, I think there's a, a, a kind of a strange miswired energy about Colombia sometimes. And, and yeah, um, I think there's a kind of a range of factors. I mean, I think sometimes it, it, it's uh, fairly strong cultural links with the US. It's a bit closer to the US than, than Argentina and Uruguay, both kind of geographically and culturally, I think. That so I clearly think legitimized of... the sport there, didn't it? I mean, I, I, I yeah. went a few times. I discovered it in, in, in the, the Copa America 2001. And the next time I was there, 2003, I was seeing women's football. And it really amazed me because it just, I, yeah. I, I was like, you know, how? What, what, what's going on here? Uh, and it was, a yeah. mate, it was a mate who I'd met. It was a, a, a PE teacher. Uh, and she said, it's all about cultural links with the States. Because it's been yeah. legitimized in the States, it's legitimized. It's legitimate here yeah, as well. Yeah, de facto legitimized and there. Yeah. Just to ram this one home, the other activity that she was doing with the kids was cheerleaders. Yeah, yeah, ab yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, so I think that's definitely, definitely a thing. Um, I mean, another another thing that kind of adds to it is the the number of big urban centres. I mean, yep. uh, when I was in Colombia doing field work for my for my PhD, I, I realised a lot of the players. There's this. There's very limited infrastructure for women's football, but a lot of the players had been to the same um, schools in in, um, in Cali, Medellin, um, Bogota. You know, certain cities had had spaces for women's football, and it has far more urban centres than some of the. Yeah. Um, and most South American countries are very, very centralised around one port, aren't they? Colombia yeah. is is has all these urban centres, and football is is the game the game of, of the city. I wonder also. And I haven't been there for a while, but the last time I was there, uh, I was in Cali for the big derby, the men's derby, America against Deportivo. And it just took off. There was just this riot from nowhere. You know, the police mm. went in. I don't know what they were chasing. They were chasing something. No. So the police went in and it just went all off, all off suddenly. And then the game had to be suspended. The area around the stadium was just just smoke and tear gas for hours um and it was it was just mental it was absolutely mental but even before the game loads of the shops most of the shops in the area around the big stadium there in cali were boarded up and yeah some people there were was telling me they're just pissed off with this macho atmosphere mm. around the, yeah. the, the, the 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 men's game has yeah. that you think helped the women's game to, to take place in a, in a in a different atmosphere I think so I think so I mean I think there's a there's a kind of a case for um, that the strength of machismo in Colombia almost kind of feeds into how strong the reaction is the kind of the, you, you, I think you meet some of the the strongest feminists in places like Colombia who kind of they've had so much to admit, probably the same in Brazil but they've had so 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 much to to deal to kick, with that they, to they, kick they against, kind of have to be yeah. strong to kind of kick against it so there's kind of a bit of that going on and i think definitely the us thing i mean th th this first thing this first uh era of of, of colombian women's football and the, the team that played in 2015 there's a lot of players who've been through college scholarships in the us you know so, um so so the links are kind of so so clear in that first round of players and then as you get uh, uh towards now i mean a lot of the Players have got professional contracts in Spain. It has a different dynamic now. I think that the US links are kind of are disappearing. But I think in the first instance, it was definitely that that college scholarships in the US thing. Yeah.
Yeah, I wonder how that will be affected by a second term of Donald Trump as president of the United States as we speak now. But crucially, in your book, um, as much as you focus on matches, as I've already said, and players, with the players, there are clearly some people that we, we will all know about. Um, Freddie mm. Rincon, for me, was the one that started it. Um, I'd heard of William uh, Willington Ortiz before, but I didn't really know anything about it. So it's your book that's given me the information so far. But Freddie Rincon, Brené Gita, Carlos Valderrama, we've mentioned, Faustina Spria, and for all the wrong reasons, I suppose, Andres Escobar as well. Right reasons, but sadly ending in the wrong reasons. Mm. We know the trajectory of all of those players from what you said of the women's game, um, which is propelled by a lot of enthusiasm, I must say, from seeing this one match on June the 13th uh, of, um, you, you know, that we're looking at against France in the World Cup. It's not even like a, you know, a, a big match in the World Cup. It's to get into the last 16, is it? 13th of mm -hmm. 2015. Okay. Yeah. It's a group um, game, yeah. It's a group game, right. Um and uh, 13th June 2015, the, the, there won't be any women players that you know, most of us would have heard of at all, would there? That's right. I mean, at that stage, um, I think probably even in Colombia, there was only one player who was particularly well known, Yoreli Rincon, at that stage. Uh, I mean, she was kind of a real kind of child prodigy. And by the time she was 15, 16, she'd already had contracts abroad. She'd been to the States, played a, yeah, latterly played in Italy, um, but she also played in Scandinavia where, you know, kind of there was more chance to play women's football back then. So, I mean, I think she was the one player that if you'd asked a Colombian at that stage, they, they, they might have known about. But really, yeah, I mean, yeah, even in Brazil around the same era, you know, the kind of the Marta generation, you know, some so many Brazilians wouldn't even know wouldn't even be able to get past one hand's worth of players. I think that was kind of very that's, similar in Colombia, but more extreme. That's the same in Shakespeare's day, isn't it? That, you know, after Shakespeare and maybe Ben Jonson, all the rest sort of fade into insignificance. There's no point in sort of doing a degree in that era of literature because it's going to be Shakespeare mm -hmm. and Ben Jonson. End of story. Uh, and I would have thought in Ways Colombia... Words. Yeah, well, fascinating the, the way his mind works. It's well, that's the first thing I thought about. But I would have thought in Colombia that the one name that people would know about was the woman who's eloquently named Lady Andrade. Um, she scores the first goal in this. She scores the first goal in this. Well, I thought of Andrade, the famous historical Andrade, Tim, that you've told us about in terms of is it Uruguayan football that Andrade yes, yes, came yeah. up in? Yeah, I immediately thought of that. I know you've said that Andrade. Andrade's a relatively common name. In, as uh, is Rincon, as we've already discovered, you know. Indeed, yes. indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but Lady Andrade scores the first goal, and it's not a bad goal. It's not a bad goal. It's a terrific um, goal. Terrific yeah. goal. Yeah. It's beautifully put away. The lovely oh, defence yeah. splitting ball. Yeah, yeah. no, the, the pass is Yoreli Rincon, who's like the, the most creative player, and it's just like, she just has a couple of seconds, just feeds the ball in behind, and... The French defence are kind of a bit slow to react. It's like I think both the centre halves are a bit flat footed and the goalkeeper could be off the line a bit quicker, but kind of barring that, it's, yeah, it's a lovely goal. I mean, she just takes it really well. And it's, it's the first one they've ever scored in a in a in a mm. World Cup, isn't it? So second, it's, it's, actually. Second, right? In they've the got one in the opening game against Mexico, yeah. Yes. Did, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, the second goal, first time they've uh, been a, well, no, they went ahead in the other game as well. But yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's a big moment for them though. I mean, especially kind of against the run of play. Well, they've the got no right to win this game, have they? they have absolutely the no right to win this game. And really, yeah. probably on the balance of play, they don't have they don't have much of a right to win this game. And if no. you look at the shot stats, it's lined up for for France. Yeah, but that that, like that round thing ball. just won't go in. That thing with a net in the back, will it? Yeah, no. they tried and no. they huffed and they puffed, <laughs> or they le huffed and they le puffed. <laughs> and you've got absolutely no right to win a game in which the opposition's goalkeeper dribbles your centre forward, which is a moment to relish <laughs> <laughs> run in the game. But come on, is. Is. she is hoisted with her own heater, heater petard, isn't yeah. she? Yeah. To take it back to the medieval age. 
Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was well done. <laughs> That's going like to be a theme think, today. Yeah, I like to think the Petard part is a much more modern reference uh, in terms of TV. <laughs> I bow to program. your knowledge of Petards. In TV, but the way they celebrate, <laughs> thank you. The way they celebrate that first goal mm. should have told France that they were up against more than just the theme. It was almost like, you know, yeah, the gods were with them. Mm -hmm. but, and th this, I think, Mark, is an interesting th point about South American football in general, that, that there's a perception often from abroad that it's all about going out and having a good time and, and the result doesn't really mm. matter. Yeah, we've we've both couldn't we've be, both li li live close enough to the beast to know just how wrong that is, and I can't yeah, think of many be better really. examples in the Colombian women's team. You are yeah. you do not want to get in a scrap with these people, do you? When no, the going when right. the going gets tough, these people are going to get tougher. Yeah. They can mix it up, yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah, and they play really feistily against France. I mean, I think probably it's an intentional thing. It's just like obviously the only way to even up the odds is to is, is to give them a few fouls, you know, and, and sure enough, they do that, you know, and it, it's up to the referee to sanction it if it feels like any of them are a yellow card. But yeah, you can you can see the French players are a bit like, oh, we didn't expect this. Um, with, with a nod to your uh, your uh, near Mancunian origins, it's a nation of knobby styleses. <laughs> well, you could say that, Tim. You he won a World that. Cup. Don't be cheeky, Tim. He won a World Cup. Let's let's not forget that. One of my favourite football stories is Nobby Ch Nobby Styles getting sent off uh, against the Studiantes in the final of the club uh, the, the club World Cup, uh, and um, he uh, he's, he's given it all the dissent, and the referee mm -hmm. calls him over and says, "What did you say?" And Nobby Styles says, "You can't fucking see. Turns out you can't fucking hear either." So uh, <laughs> off he goes. <laughs> yeah, Brilliant. Of course. Um, one of my earliest uh, memories of you know anecdotes in football was Nobby Styles. Not a lot of people know this. Was the first footballer in top flight football to wear contact lenses. Um, we didn't even know in those days that he wore glasses. So that was a little bit of a uh, wake up call uh, for us. Anyway. Um, Contact lenses in those days cost £200. I can't remember if it was £200 a pair or £200 per contact lens. And uh, um, they asked Nobby Styles, well, what happens if, you know, one of them drops out? And he says, well, all 22 players will get down on their hands and knees. <laughs> I started wearing them when I was 16. That's part of my youth. Man. Well, you youth. know that. Yeah. You, you know how, how the you know, cost in a, in a, of them In a woman's hair, down. you know, that, that, was, that was the most dangerous thing. <laughs> I didn't realize. That's where you lose them. I've, I've, I've never, ever worn them. Um the the elephant, lane. the elephant in the room when we talk of Colombian football, though, is the influence of not least uh, the cartels on the football game, the men's game. And I know it's a bit of a stereotype. You kind of hint at that in your um, in your book. It's a little bit of a stereotype to talk about it. But are we to say that the women's game is? And I mean this in the sort of social context way, not any other way is drugs free? Uh, I would, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I would, I would say largely, largely. I mean, I, I, the, the state of the clubs now, I don't know if you, you ever have full transparency about it, but, but I would say it, it was much less influential. Well, it probably doesn't yet that... generate enough money to, to, to launder large sums through it, does it? Well, yeah, I think that's probably the, the, the the quickest way to say it, yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, yeah. it's it's a, I think it's an important question in terms of yeah. Colombia because of the kind of pressure that the women's team would be feeling when they enter international co competitions compared to the men's team. Mm, mm. Yeah, I think the dynamic with the women's team is is so different. I mean, I, I chose the game I chose because. Uh, the game was really rooted in amateurism at that time. There was this kind of very little institutional support. And perhaps as a result of that 2015 result, that the Women's Professional League is launched in 2017, just two years later. And then a bit more money comes into it. And then the Continental Federation, Comdebol, is kind of forcing teams to, to, to open a women's team so that they can compete in the male Libertadores. So it's kind of, I mean, that policy is quite controversial because... Some teams kind of open a women's team, but only kind of pay lip service to the idea. So it's kind of, 
Um, something needed to be done to kind of coerce them into action, but but yeah, sometimes they don't enter into the spirit of of of, of, of really growing the women's team. It's just like, okay, we have a women's team now. Can we continue playing the men's Libertadores? So Meaning that kind of an element. the players as well as athletes, they have to be activists as well. Yeah, yeah, very much so. And the players have been great in that respect. <laughs> um, I mean, in the kind of intervening period between the giant killing kind of victory against France in 2015 and the victory last year against Germany, when they're more or less going punch for punch with Germany, really, they're kind of playing as equals. Uh, they beat Germany in, the, in, in last year's World Cup. Uh, in that kind of intervening period, there's a lot of activism by players. And there's a period where maybe four or five of the best players including Yoreli Vincon, Natalia Gaetan, uh, Isabella Echeverri. Um, some of the best players, like, suddenly are just not being selected. And the Colombian Federation kind of deny that there's any kind of veto. But it seems very suspicious that the three, four, five most outspoken players are no longer being selected. Uh, and then there's a, there's a period of 12 months where the Colombian women's team don't even play a friendly because the federation just stops organizing games. Again, that seems mightily suspicious. It's kind of, um, and yeah, they have a really bad run of luck because there's a period when they play a Copa America in Chile in, in 2018. And uh, they finished fourth in that, which seems kind of a respectable position. But they're really disappointed with that because they know that they're at least the second team and should even be pushing Brazil to win the thing. Uh, so fourth is a bit of a failure and they get kind of triple punished for it because they don't they do not do well in the Copa America. They, they finish below where they want to. And the Copa America final positions are used for qualification for the next Olympics and for the next World Cup. So they miss both the Tokyo Olympics and the 2019 World Cup in France as a result of this Copa America. And that's all kind of, that's all going on when, when all these good players are not getting selected because of this being outspoken, the, the kind of activism that Tim was referring to. Uh, so yeah, and there's also a couple of scandals. There was a sexual harassment scandal um, whereby the physiotherapist uh, alleged sexual harassment against uh, one of the, the management team at that time. And that kind of emboldened the players to be more outspoken. The kind of more people were speaking out about such things. Um, and yeah, kind of a whole range of kind of uh, fractious kind of activity with the Federation kind of really hampers them for a long time. And they only come back really strong at the, at the last World Cup uh, last year when, when, when they reached the quarterfinals and really push England in the quarterfinal. It really on another day could have maybe edged England out and even got to the semis. So they're kind of really strong in that World Cup. Uh, but yeah, I think what I was kind of getting at was it's a different dynamic to the men's uh, team insofar as the players are quite often motivated by by almost showing their own federation who, who, who kind of don't support them institutionally. They're, they're like, we'll show you, you know, so that so they kind of have double motivation. They're really proud to so proud to represent the Colombian nation, the Colombian flag, but they also want to prove a point to the to, to the people who don't support them. And, and, and the federation is almost all male. It, it kind of kind of takes predictable decisions kind of which which go against them all the time. So um yeah they're kind of really highly motivated by by those factors they kind of use it as fuel rather than rather than just be angry about it it's kind it, of it's kind it, of in in the men's game i mean the greatest colombian coach the one who's so associated with the rise of colombian football Pacho mm -hmm. is black and you often yeah. see black coaches in colombian football they're far ahead of brazil in in that respect what about female coaches? Who's coaching the national team and who's coaching the Colombian women's uh, the the women's sides in the Colombian league? Colombian team is yet to have a female coach. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's it's just not on the cards at the moment. Uh, and even in the club game, most of the main uh, coaches, if not all, uh, are male. Uh, female coaches is kind of, I think it's probably the next step for for. Uh, South American women's football more broadly. I think even in Brazil, uh, the the coach who, who's led Corinthians to so many Libertadores, uh, women's Libertadores titles is is male. Um, and yeah, I mean, there was a moment with Brazil when they had Emily Lima uh, as, the, as the national team coach, uh, but that was kind of curtailed 
probably too early in my opinion on the ba- on the base of basis of kind of sketchy evidence but it was almost like they wanted to put a lid on that i don't i don't think the federations are kind of comfortable with women coaches which is which is a huge problem um it's a problem globally really i mean um until serena serena Wiegmann, it, it, um you know england at that period under phil neville um and it's not to, i'm not to say that there, that, that there can't be male coach, coaches but i think um getting female coaches good opportunities is a real issue for the for the game more broadly i think is there a sign of that this pioneering generation of players as they leave the scene is there any sign that they're going to stay on as coaches i used to ask them this all the time because for my phd i, I spent months with with, with, with with women players and I'd said, do you want to be a coach afterwards? I, I was kind of hoping for, for, for a yes. And, and, and more often than not, they, they, they weren't sure. And I think, I think it was probably they weren't sure if the opportunities would be there rather than they weren't sure if they would be interested. I think perhaps theoretically the interest might be there, but it's kind of, um, yeah, whether the doors are open for it to happen. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think with time, the, one or two of the bigger clubs will perhaps be braver and let it happen. But I mean, there's nothing to be brave about, really. It's just something that should have happened ages ago. Um, so yeah, so it, it's a it's an eternal frustration for the players. I think. I think. Um, yeah. And think, you, uh, you see that this all of this warrior us against the world spirit as they mm. hold on against France and ride their luck against France. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I remember watching the game, and I, uh, and the more it goes on, as you get to the hour mark, you just you start to think they just might do this. You know, it's like the the amount of times that that, that France have come close or hit the woodwork or, or the keepers pulled off an amazing save, and you think we've, we've reached the hour mark. They just might do this. I remember being on the edge of my seat, thinking, "Can it happen?" And, and you know, even at the hour mark, it's like. Surely they'll break through eventually, but but yeah, it just doesn't quite happen. And yeah, dogged defending, just kind of yeah, foul after foul. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't often cheer fouls, but I remember that day. I was like, "That's a good foul. That's a good foul." You really broke up. The- <laughs> I was I was <laughs> I was really into it. But, uh, but, but yeah. There is a difference between a good foul, you know, and a bad foul. A bad foul surely is a, a foul that doesn't give you any advantage whatsoever. <laughs> In fact, like a man who, who's committed one. Well, yes, and had a few committed against me as well. Um, (laughs) Tim mentioned Francisco Machirama in passing there. He gets a chapter of his own in your book and deserves it. Absolutely deserves it. He deserves one, absolutely, yeah. Indeed. Um, And you talk about him as a ponderous uh, coach that sets a tone for the team uh, for the long period that he was the coach as well is there the kind of identity with Colombian women's football that that clearly was at least with Colombian men's football you know there was a period we expected them to be the original tiki tackers didn't we of football and uh, it was just mesmerizing to watch them with Carlos Van Drama pulling the strings but nevertheless is there that's the identity that stays you know, nevertheless, even though it might have evolved since then, is there a similar or different identity? Is there an identity overall in in this uh, women's game that we've been looking at against France and uh, subsequently? Or is the only identity win, get over the line however you can? Yeah, I mean, I think these things are kind of shifting all the time, aren't they, as well? There's kind of moments where, where a certain football kind of takes precedence. There's moments when the results... Uh, seem to take precedence. But yeah, I mean, I think with the women's team, there's a massive influence from the US. Like if you speak to the players, they'll say the, the, the players they most admire are some of the, you know, the heroes of the of the US uh, World Cup winning teams. Uh, so I think they look to the US a lot. And, you know, maybe, maybe that football is a, probably a bit more direct, kind of stereotypically. Um, but then sometimes, yeah, you, when you're watching the games, you think, wow, they've got a bit of the kind of ticky tacker about them as well. So I think, I don't know, it kind of adapts to, to the moments, doesn't it? It's kind of, there's a, there's a bit of, bit of everything there. You know, if you, if you ask the, the women players, they'll say, ah, oh, I really look up to Valderrama, but then the next, you know, next day it could be Alex Morgan or Megan Rapino or, so, so there's a bit of, there's a bit of everything going on, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it, does it, does it need an identity? Does the women's game... Uh, well, every football 
every football team needs some kind of identity, doesn't it? And does um, maybe the question is, does the Colombia women's team need an identity nailed down as such? So they all they all buy into the same ethos, if you like. I'm not sure if it if it needs one, but I think if you if you get a team that kind of doesn't have a, a really fixed identity, I think it's a little bit more malleable for whoever picks it up. I think you can kind of you can do what you like with it if it's not kind of there's not a kind of an expected style. Uh, what do you what do you think about that, Tim? I, the what fascinates me here is just the globalization of everything, which has all probably always yeah. been there in football, like the great well, Maturana side of the the late eighties and early early nineties is such a stereotypical South American side in many ways. You know, at yeah. a time when both Brazil and Argentina are, are going with back threes, they, they're back four. But also, there's so much of Holland 74 in what they're doing. You know, Absolutely, so yeah. ideas are always pinging their way back and forth, yeah. back yeah. and forth, back and forth, as Cameo uh, yeah. once said. In his in his red <laughs> codpiece or whatever it was, the Federal cameo. Um, so you know that these ideas are Larry always, Blackman. Larry, Larry Blackman. Blackman. Yeah. These ideas, yeah. uh, she's strange, but I like it. These ideas are always <laughs> kind of kind of going around, and maybe in in today's age, that's even more commonplace because you know the Colombians are growing up with the, with the US players as, as as their idols. Sure, that's right. I think yeah, I think that that exchange of ideas is always there as long as people are open to it isn't it and uh, the players obviously greatly admire the us uh yeah they'll, they'll mention some of the german players french players sometimes and yeah it's just whatever they've seen and in, in the global era they're kind of exposed to a lot more a lot earlier i guess i get and the idea what... now that colombia the women's team are seen and will be seen in future tournaments as an opponent that you don't want well yeah yeah yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think being able to 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 export the players to to top leagues as well is going to really help them. I think I think you could see last year when they went punch for punch with Germany, you could see that they had a a nucleus of players playing in that Spanish league with Aitana Bonmati and Alexia Putellas and all all the great Spanish players. And you know, it was no coincidence. You know, Spain won the tournament. I think I think the European leagues are going from strength to strength, and and, and being able to play in those leagues is definitely helping the Colombian players reach the next level. But I think much like the men's game, this this kind of reliance on export into European leagues or, or, or you know, maybe to the North American League in the in the case of Colombian uh, the Colombian women's team, it's also a problem, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's very much a double edged sword, this one, isn't it? I mean the the so Colombian why? Well, because well, the, 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 the Colombian men's teams, they exist for one reason and one reason alone sell players as quickly as possible. It's all that's all they want to do. They've got no interest in anything else apart from mm. selling players. So the movement of players abroad, it yes, it gives those players experience in elite leagues, but it also hollows out your your domestic league. And the yeah. Colombian performance in, in recent times in in the men's international competitions has been deplorable, really awful, and massively worse. Mm. Than Ecuador, mm. and Ecuador is is you know a fraction of the size of Colombia. Colombian clubs in the men's game they should be doing far far better than they are, but all mm. they want to do is sell. And the emergence of Major League Soccer has just worsened the problem. Um, the emergence yeah. of Brazil as a buyer from the rest of of, of the continent has worsened the problem, and, and so and the only player in the Colombia squad that uh, that reached the final of the Copa America is one of the, the one the only home base player just like Argentina it's one of the substitute goalkeepers because they all play abroad yeah i mean i remember when they when they launched the women's professional league in 2017 i mean di mayor the colombian federation like a very very kind of ambitious there was a there was a lot of kind of ambitious rhetoric about how good it was going to be they were going to have the best women's league on the continent it was or or you know it was going to be modeled on the spanish league or the or the north american leagues it was going to be absolutely massive and then yeah kind of a few years in and and, and there's such a massive kind of talent flight that it's kind of difficult for it to be credible for it to, to, to be the best league and you know the calendar hasn't been extended like it should have been i mean i think i think they've got to kind of a five six month season now but it's nowhere near as long as the men's one so it's like uh, a lot of the rhetoric about how good the, the the leagues was going to be has kind of given way to this kind of 
uh, pattern that Tim's described, whereby, yeah, the, the clubs are actually thinking we could sell a few this year and then sell a few more. And that, you know, that could, yeah, that could be the model instead. Uh, so, Des- despite yeah. all this, do you see them as potential women's World Cup winners? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think I say in the book towards the end, like uh, I predict that Colombia will one day win a World Cup and I'm not quite sure whether it will be the men or the women first. I think, <laughs> well, I think. That would be the question, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I think I think both are now credible candidates to, to win a World Cup. I mean, like I said earlier, I think in last year's World Cup, they could have easily edged England out in the quarter and then if they got to the semis, who knows? Uh, so, I mean, they've already reached the same lab, uh, same stage of a World Cup as the men, the quarters. And um, yeah, I think there's every possibility. I think they're, they're a determined and formidable opponent now. And uh, as long as they've got players playing in the top leagues, like, said, like Tim says, it's a double-edged sword. But but if you if you can come at, come to tournaments with players playing at a highly competitive level, which they didn't have in 2015 in this this kind of park the bus game that I was describing, you know, if you can come with competitive players, uh, why not? It's possible. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Um, it? It sounds like the women's game has managed to match the men's game um, in terms of possibility, at least. It'll be interesting watching which of these teams. Uh, and I, I, I believe you, you know, when you say that the women's team have got a good shot at winning the World Cup, I tend to sort of think probably uh, before the men's team will win. And the reason I say that is not because Colombia isn't always exciting to watch, but as we've seen in the globalisation that Tim mentioned before of football, uh, the European teams just keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And Mm. uh, South American teams, yeah, because their players are playing in Europe, um, are getting stronger. But I can't see Colombia itself having enough strength in depth to overturn some of the big uh, hitters in the men's game anytime soon. But, you know, the women's game might be a different thing completely. How comes you're in Colombia? Are you, do you live in Colombia then, Mark? I'm living in Turkey at the moment, actually. I've just oh, wow. moved to, yeah, to, to work at a university in Turkey. So, yep. But I've lived in Colombia in the past and Ecuador as well. Uh-huh. So and there's, a part, be... there's a part of him which is forever Oldham. Of course there absolutely, is. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's part yeah. of all of us well, that's forever older. I've, I've been to yeah, see football there as well. I, I have been to I have been to the Oldham ground. Um, I think we got a victory. Charlton got a victory against Oldham, um, against the odds that time. And uh, I, I love the way that those old school grounds are just in the middle of the community, as, you know, of a residential area kind of thing. It's one of those yeah, kind of grounds. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, a little bit like looting in that respect, kind of. You, you can... Almost Indeed. see the match from from Indeed. people's houses, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the way it should be. That's that's oh. the way it should be. Um, so there'll be a book, hopefully, on Turkish uh, women's football uh, at some point in the future. Absolutely. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I, I think I'll have to learn a, a, a hell of a lot more first. But yeah, yeah, I would love to do that one day. I, I can't wait for that. So uh, we've been talking about this match uh, on June the thirteenth, um, two thousand and fifteen. Uh, Colombia against France is well worth seeing, not least for that dribble by the goalkeeper of the centre forward. It shouldn't happen, but... but Doesn't end up well for her. Doesn't end up well. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say, the Colombians get their own back. But the book is Viva Colombia, Social History of Colombian Footballer in 15 Players. Um, You know that we always have a soundtrack to our conversations about a football uh, match, Mark. Um, Unfortunately for you, <laughs> <laughs> he chose the game. He well, chose he the did. game. He, he, he forced did. us down this this dismal yeah, route. He did. But he didn't choose the charts of the day. And maybe he omitted to think, oh, I've got to make sense of the charts as well um, after choosing that game. So um, let's talk briefly about the charts. I think now, it's first, first of all, Mark, what, what's your what's your musical background? Are you one of those miserable Oldham Smiths fans, something like that? Is that where, you, is that where your heart Absol- is? Abso- absolutely not, no. They drive me <laughs> mad. No, uh, no, it's a little bit all over the place, my music taste. Um, maybe not so different from, from your own. Um, I think, um, I mean, I like a lot of music in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, like a lot of classic stuff. Um, yeah, 
You like the fardos? Do you? Like fardos? Do you like a, a real ballad, a soppy, um, oh, heartbreak? Like heartbreak. Like yeah. Well, you can't get past yeah. them, can you? Those fardos. No. Um, no, no. Having Maybe said that, mood. having said that, the top ten wasn't bad, was it, Mark? It wasn't too bad. I thought it was kind of the tale of two Pharrell Williams. Uh, yes. Track, wasn't it, really? Um, or, or we could say the tale of one Pharrell Williams and one certain Marvin Gaye. Yes. yes Niall, yeah. Niall Rogers. Niall Indeed. Rogers was it's all to get a mention together. here, I think, definitely. And let's yeah. not mention, let's not forget Sam Smith, who was killing it at this time, you know, and if he had stuck to the plan, probably would still be killing it today, but... He, he he went off on a different plan. Um, I, I think the charts, uh, top five in particular, well, top four actually in particular, were brilliant, and I, I wanted more. Um, Blurred lines at number one. Um, a I, I wasn't so like, sure about that one, but I, I I really enjoy Get Lucky, the the, the Daft Punk track, with, and that's the Nile Rodgers one, isn't it? it? Yeah. Sure, it is. Did you, yeah. do you have you not heard the original of Blurred Lines, the Marvin Gaye original? Of course, of course. Um, yeah, I yeah. know, I, I know that it splits Marvin Gaye fans. Tim, you can have your say on this in a moment. I know it splits Marvin Gaye fans, but I think they actually what they should have done, what they didn't do, was credit Marvin Gaye. So they ended up in court with Marvin Gaye's family saying, yeah. oh, "Come on, guys, you know, just yeah. just pay up, just pay up." Let's and that be was serious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I was that was unfortunate. Give, give us a drink, mate. Give us a drink. <laughs> <laughs> that's drink exactly how they said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. how they. That, those weren't the words they said. <laughs> but that's exactly. Give us a drink, Your Honor. <laughs> 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 but funny enough, the first time I heard it, I didn't think it was got to give it up. I didn't think of it because mm -hmm. they've got their own sort of refrain in that. They've yep. got a hook of their own. And so you don't necessarily think about the melody and the music, etc. And it wasn't until somebody points out to you, oh, yeah, yeah, that's just a, mm -hmm. a, a pop ripoff of Marvin okay. Gaye. That suddenly, <laughs> yeah, exactly, that you suddenly realise you, you've been had. And sometimes it's like that with pop music. Sometimes they can add something to songs that were out there before, for better or worse, but they will find an audience because the core of the song, Blurred Lines, and the lyrics might be controversial as well, people say, but let's put yeah, that to one I side. That. Yeah. Well, yeah, but if we put that to one side for a moment, feel free to bring it back in. But um, the core of the song is solid. It's based on a solid foundation, and that is Marvin Gaye's Got to Give It Up. You can hear the junkie in Marvin Gaye in that song, can't you? It's a it's 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 a junky groove, isn't it? That <sighs> why do you have to say it like that, Tim? Well, it is. I mean, <laughs> he's is already the... on a yellow card from earlier on. If I, remember I, right. I, I, I know Although a guy. From the same person, admittedly, but I I know a guy, or I knew a guy. I haven't seen him for many years, and he was quite a well-known person. Let's put it that way. Who had um, the same cocaine dealer as uh, Marvin Gaye? I've never taken cocaine in my life, so I don't know what that means. But the cocaine dealer was up on trial and the cocaine dealer got hold of this guy that I know to say to him, look, get hold of Marvin so that Marvin could go and testify on my behalf. And Marvin did. Um, and I thought, well, you know, you might have had your demons, but, you know, you you didn't shy away from supporting those who, you know, may have been feeding your habit, but you thought were good people. And, um, you know, for that, I think, well, Marvin Gaye is a particular kind of uh, addict and it still has a lot of respect in my view. Um, yeah. So do you want to talk about the lyrics then, Mark? Blurred lines? Um, I'm not sure. No, I just I hasten to add that I've, I've never had never tried cocaine either and never had more than a couple of paracetamol just just look i know i once had a bolivian girlfriend and i know from this uh, i'm not i'm not suggesting that anybody that goes over to that part of south america is taking cocaine in fact she would deny it that she'd ever taken cocaine but when her 
family came over to Sweden as um, as refugees. Her mother came with a suitcase full of coca leaves. And when they tried to take wow. it off her at the airport, she went ballistic and said, how can we, how are we expected to live without these coca leaves? <laughs> <laughs> but they've never taken cocaine, like I say. What about La 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 uh, or La La La, La La La, Three Las um, by Sam Smith, boy Sam Smith? That was a hook. And that was, it's essentially a hook, isn't it? But is it effective for you? I'd have to defer to you on that one. I'm not sure I'm familiar with that one. I think it's not really it's not really aimed at us, is it? You know, but it's 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 likable neo. A lot of this, the, the top of the charts, is quite likable neo soul, isn't it? Yes, yes. Um, let her go. I yeah, think there's a little bit of neo soul about it. You think so? Yeah, I you think. say you see, yeah, you think it's mawkish, but it's a great song. I don't like so. mawkish music. Yeah, I don't want to feel it, mortgage. I don't like. No, I don't want it. Yeah, I want it. I want. Mark, do you want to come in and uh, bring about a bit of peace between me and Tim on this? Well, if it sells, uh, yeah. you'll like it. You know, that, that's the way you are. You spent too no, long in the music no, business. No, no, and if it no. sells, you think it's if, good. No, no. Hang Whereas on, I'm a little bit more philosophical than that. <laughs> um, yeah. Mine is if it sells, there's a reason. For it's selling. I don't necessarily get it. I don't necessarily get the reasons for it's selling, but I won't be as um, cut off to it as perhaps you might be because you think that the song is crap. I think to myself, well, maybe my hearing is crap. Maybe I'm missing something here. And uh, yeah, he did... sorry, go on, Mark. No, I think I might I might share a similar kind of uh, anti-commercial sensibility with with, 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 yeah, with Tim. Yeah, uh, everybody think, does. Yeah, yeah everybody everybody does. Does. all roads lead us back to Bolivia because um, when when <laughs> Reggie Perry, when Reggie yeah. no, when I'm, Reggie yeah, I'm, Perry, I'm paying for this as well. Rip, <laughs> when he rebels against being in this corporate world uh, and and selling ice creams for a living, uh, he goes to it's the first sign. And he, he goes to a new launch, a tasting session for um, sun, Sunshine Desserts range of exotic ices. Uh, it's better be to, good, Tim. It's you, better you be good. Taste, you have to taste them and then say what, uh, what the taste is. Uh, and he, Reggie Perrin's answer to all of them, after tasting the entire range of exotic ices, he said that all of them had the taste of a Bolivian unicyclist jockstrap. So um, that that's uh, that, that's one of the things that Bolivia yeah. brings to mind. I was I was, I was hoping I was hoping. That's a t- yeah, that's very well, yeah, you might think so, Mark. But I was hoping that the <laughs> anecdote would end up much more side splitting than that. But hey, yeah. got to take. Okay, we've done the top four. Can we hop over to number thirty? Seven of our away? tasters say that it smells. It smells of exotic coconut. One. That it smells of Bolivian unicyclist jock straps. It's absolutely fucking brilliant. Yes, I wonder you're still so trying to sell it to me. You're still trying to sell it to me. It's a lot easier selling me all the songs that sell loads and loads and loads uh, than that one. But should we move to number 38? Um, Ordinary People, John Why Legend. What, what's the number 38? John oh, Legend's oh, Ordinary no. People, which, ah. funny enough, my missus has done a version of this, which is much more ah. upbeat. His version's... Um, you talk about Morkish, uh, Tim, and this is Neo Soul for you, by the way. I really like him when he's upbeat. Give him the green light. Yeah, but, but well, what does your light. missus bring to the table, Dutton? Sorry? On this one. What does your missus bring to the table on this well, one? Well, I'll tell you what she does, because um, his version is uh, almost like a dirge. You know, it could be a funeral <laughs> march yes, almost. Yes, yeah. It's very oh, sad. Oh, my mum would she not does, be happy. She's a big job. Apologies. Jump. I apologise to your mum. What I would say my missus brings to it, she brings a little bit of a Calypso feel to it. You know, hers is like a a little bit of a Calypso song. And it does work, actually. It does. uh, I think hers is brilliant. I think his is brilliant as well, by the way, but it puts you in a completely different mood. You know, when we were talking earlier about the, um, the mood that a manager can bring into a football team, well, mm, the same mm. thing as the mood a producer can bring uh, to a record, actually. Um, if the uh-huh. uh, if the producer says to the drummer, okay, pick up, pick up the beat, pick up the beat, pick up the beat, that changes yeah, yeah. everything. It changes absolutely everything. Changes the way that John Legend sings it. 
Uh, yeah. Doesn't change the way necessarily the lyrics are, but it changes every single other thing about the uh, song. And uh, yeah, that's mm. the difference there. But this was also the chart of the Gangnam style. Now, those of you who remember the Gangnam style straight out of uh, South Korea, um, K-pop, as it were, um, there are two, uh, Psy was the name of the artist, PSY, of the uh, South Korean artist. It came up out initially with the Gangnam style. And um, um, <laughs> I remember one of my daughters, my younger daughter, at the age of about 10, she said, yeah, 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 I'm not into K-pop anymore. Everybody's into it now, this Gangnam style thing. That was the first time I ever heard of Gangnam style. How, like do, how do they ever make that trendy? How do they do that? Totally love it. I think yeah. K-pop had been bubbling under for some time, and it was one of those exotic things. We couldn't quite get it. Well, why K-pop? Living unicyclist what... jockstrap? <laughs> <laughs> new, <laughs> new, I'd get a laugh out of you. New. Well, if I mine that scene for long enough. <laughs> yes. Yes, if you mine it for long enough, and you've mined it for far too long, some people would suggest. But, yeah, you did get a laugh out of me. Gangnam Styles at number 70, Gentleman, which was his follow-up, which wasn't quite as good is about number 50 or so um, in the charts. And, uh, well, what can I say, Mark? Because uh, Tim Van keeps Morrison's mining, in the chart. mining Brown that. Brown-Eyed Girl. Yeah, there was a it's young girl. It's release Brown-Eyed Girl. But that, it's a re-release. Obviously, It's a yeah. re-release. Obviously, there must have been yeah. a movie or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, that it featured in. And, and so it's got back Mr. into the charts. Mr. was in there somewhere as well. Another Exactly. One I've interviewed the killers actually, and uh, for them, oh, yeah. still till today, um, they can't quite understand the appeal of Mr. Brightside, but they can't play a gig without it. They can't play any no, gig without it. No at chance. All. Exactly. No chance. But, you know, sometimes the artists are taken by surprise at which one of the songs on their album is the one that goes and is a hit. Uh, like Ghetto Superstar, Praz Michelle at number 59 here. Um, that was part of a movie. Was it was a movie called Bullmore or something like that about um, uh, what's his name uh, Warren Beatty being a senator, an American senator or president or or wannabe president. I seem to remember, but people have long forgotten the movie. But the track Ghetto Superstar um, is still out there and it's still sort of echoing as a result yeah so with the dog barking is it time to call this one a day i think it is it will be. Less, columbia have hung on less... they've hung on oh. they've got there. oh just yeah. one more just one more at number 17 going downwards is read all about it emily sanday she's amazing i've seen her live at ronnie scott's in london she was absolutely amazing and this read all about it is a very very clever song which she plays a piano to it or solo, I think, on stage. She just accompanies herself on piano and you hear other sort of aspects of it that perhaps you don't hear when it comes out. It starts off with a piano uh, solo, but then once it gets all the other instruments kicking in, the drums, the bass, etc., it becomes, you know, um, it's still a decent song, but um, not quite the way that I remember it. But yeah. Um, read, all so about let's call, one, read all about yeah. it. One day, Colombia's going to win the World Cup. We don't know if it's going to be men or women first, but read all about it. And you heard it right here first on the Brazilian Shirtland podcast. And read all about it. Tim's got to go for an appointment with his tailors. Read all about it. Remember where you heard it first on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. Uh, did I say a bit too much? Was that more than you intended me to say, Tim, on that? No, um, it's great. It's you, terrific. You know, your tailor's waiting as we speak. He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well. Yeah, he's uh, going to make so, me a suit. I'm going to have a suit now. I'm 60 next year. He's making me a suit. If I gave him the wool, would he make me one? Well, we'd have to take your measurements. Um, there might be extra yeah. quantities of fabric required. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> that was so low. <laughs> Mark, was. was that not it low? Was. It was. It was. That was yeah, low. especially for a man already on a double yellow card. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's Mark, Colombian it's spirit. It's been an absolutely amazing conversation. Honestly, the book is worth checking out. It's called Viva Colombia, Secret History of Colombian Football in 15 Players uh, by our guest, Mark Biram. Tim, thank you very much. Say hello to your tailor for, from me. <laughs> Tell him it's a shame I can't afford uh, to use him till I lose a bit of weight. Mark, welcome back anytime. I think there's a lot more to talk about. We could go through each of those 15 players 
um, and the manager um, within the course of different programs or different podcasts. So feel free to join us again. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Good luck with the book.